this happened back in 2016 or so. My ex at the time and I were road tripping around Utah. We started in Seagull Canyon by Thompson Springs north of Crescent Junction. It's a very cool, creepy spot with Native American rock art dating back to right around 2000 BC, almost 4000 years ago. I would highly recommend it, but be warned, it's eerie and I tend to believe Native Americans painted those petroglyphs as warnings of some sort. From there we hopped back onto I-70 and through Green River and then south on 24, which actually takes you right past Goblin State Park. It was about 2 in the morning by the time we got to Goblin and my girlfriend was asleep with my dog Cookie in the back of my truck so I decided to pull over to take a little break and stretch my legs. So I pulled over to the side of the road and got out to have a toke and that's when I noticed something was off. It was too quiet. The night was too still. Just then a deer ran out of the brush and nearly gave me a heart attack. Laughing a bit, I took a few steps out into the darkness so as to not wake up my ex. I unzipped to go and that's when I heard my dog growling from the back of the truck. Cookie, cookie, I whispered. Hush, it's just me. Come look over here, baby. What the? My girlfriend's voice from out in the shadows, but when had she gotten out of the truck, and why hadn't I noticed her walk past me? Lauren, I said, walking towards the voice. Come look over here, baby, she said again. Lauren, are you okay? What's going on? I asked. Cookie's low growl then turned into a ferocious bark, which actually snapped me out of my trance, and that's when I heard Lauren the real Lauren, from back at the truck. Connor? She said in a half-sleep state. If that's Lauren, then who? I was knocked flat on my back, and I looked up to see what looked like a half-lady, half-coyote creature peering down at me. Her eyes were somehow beautiful, with a soft white glow to them that reminded me of winter. Her nose was long and looked like a coyote but without the fur, and she had long white teeth protruding out from her mouth. She had two tall pointy ears on the top of her head, and she appeared to be wearing a coyote pelt around her shoulders. She tilted her head to the side before opening her mouth, revealing a row of dagger-like teeth. Her lower jaw was hanging down in an unnatural angle and she looked like she was making it bigger to bite my head off or something. That's when Cookie came bolting out of the back of the truck, slamming into the creature with some considerable force, knocking her off me. That's when I saw the rest of her body. She was long, at least six feet, and she had a full bushy tail, but her hands and feet were those of a human woman. Her body was wrapped in furs, but you could see black and red stripes painted on her naked body in between the patchy pelts. She then started to kick Cookie off of her and ran off into the bush. I ran over to make sure Cookie was okay and thank God she was. I scooped her up and ran back to the truck. We gotta go, I said stumbling up to the driver's seat. We peeled out onto the road and I started driving way too fast. 40, 50, 60 which is when I hit a cow. That's right, I hit a cow. Apparently there was a whole herd of cattle crossing the road. Lucky for us, I just barely clipped her head right as she started to cross the road. The poor cow then started to heave, but I knew I couldn't just leave her there in agony. I then got out of the car to cut her throat with this big knife I got from a gas station. And that's when I saw her. The skinwalker was back. She had followed us, and it was most likely her that had spooked the cattle out into the road in the first place. The rest of the herd took off, and then it was just me, her, and the dying cow on the road. 
cookie was going nuts in the back of the truck and I could hear Lauren gasp as this coyote lady creature took a step towards us with her lower jaw still hanging down from her face and her eyes reflecting the light from the headlights. Just then, another car came up over the rise and the coyote lady looked up and I swear it felt like she was staring straight into my soul before letting out a blood curling scream and leaping off the road back into the night. The other car pulled up and as luck would have it, it was a BLM ranger who had seen us hit the cow. She pulled out her service Glock and put the poor cow out of her misery. I then told her what happened, but she told us it was most likely a koi wolf, a coyote wolf hybrid that's new to the region. Lauren was in a state of shock, and I didn't want us to get taken off to the loony bin, so I took the ticket for hitting a cow out on open range, and we drove to Hanksville, where we got a room for the night. I couldn't sleep a wink. Every time I closed my eyes, I just kept seeing her. And those eyes, those glowing, hypnotic, and yet somehow wild, elegant eyes. I often wonder since then who this woman was. What was she doing out there? Does she fully shift from coyote to woman? Or is she always like that? I have so many unanswered questions. I kind of want to go out and try to find her again. I just can't stop thinking about her. Sometimes I have dreams about her. What do you think? Should I try to go and find her? Let me know. Upon a recent discussion with an alumnus from a previous supply caravan to Black Mesa on the Navajo Res, it has come to my attention that one of the gals who accompanied the caravan a couple years ago had a very curious experience. I was able to get her contact info. Let's call her Amanda and we'll interview her about her encounter. In an effort to be respectful of the culture and the taboo nature of the subject matter, we decided to change the names and category of whatever this is that she experienced down there. Just a bit of background, there is a company called Peabody Coal Mining, which leases tracts of land in and around Black Mesa, and the landscape is one of shadow topographical relief marked by dry draws and arroyos which are essentially dry creek beds that flood during periods of heavy rain, which, granted, is not a very common occurrence in the high deserts of Arizona. This is what Amanda said. I was trying to retrieve a lamb who had escaped from the enclosure one afternoon. When I turned around, I couldn't seem to retrace my steps back to quote-unquote Johnny's compound where his parents' hogan is located. I was following one of the arroyos, hoping it would lead me to a road. That's when I started having asthma. I think that I started hyperventilating and had a full-blown panic attack because I lost consciousness. And when I came to it, it was nighttime. I stood up and looked around. I heard something like a twig snapping behind me and turned around to look in the pale moonlight. I thought I saw something duck behind a tree. It looked like the dark shape of a person who had been peering around the tree, but then withdrew when I noticed it. But I could tell that it was still there. So I called out. Hello? Silence. Hello? Is someone there? I'm with the Colorado caravan. I, I think I'm lost. I laughed nervously. Can you help me? After a moment or so, this figure peered back around the tree. Only this time, it looked like my friend Charlie from the caravan. The figure then stepped out from behind the tree and motioned me to follow, thinking that Charlie had been sent to bring me back to camp and still feeling a bit confused. I started to follow the figure back up the draw 
We've been walking for maybe five to ten minutes when another figure seemingly materialized from the shadows out in front of us. I felt a bolt of pain, like a severe migraine, and had to stop. When I looked up, there were three more figures, and they were standing in a semicircle before me. Now these things did not look human at all, but rather like large coyotes, and I could see ten eyes looking back at me in the dim silvery light. I started to stumble back, but the coyotes made no move to follow as I turned to run away. I ran for maybe five minutes before I stopped to catch my breath. That's when I heard another twig snap and looked back to see one of the coyote shaped silhouette up on the ridge line from back towards the direction from which I had ran. To my horror, the coyote appeared to stand up on its hind legs and let out a bone, chill and scream. I heard other people describe this before, but it almost sounded like a coyote howl magnified through a megaphone and then distorted with a heavy reverb-like sound effect. My head was pounding, but I truly fell in fear for my life, so I kept running. Eventually, I came to a service road and was able to flag down a Peabody mine worker who was driving down the road in a work vehicle. I convinced him to give me a ride and told him our caravan leader, Buck, could explain the situation to his manager if need be. As I climbed into the cab and we started driving, I looked in the rear view mirror and saw those eyes reflecting the red brake lights from the back of the truck. I don't think they followed us, but I couldn't be sure. So when the mine worker dropped me off at the compound, I ran into Johnny's parents' Hogan, which is a big no-no for non-natives, but I didn't know where else to go, and I was still very scared. Johnny's parents only spoke Denye, but I was finally able to express the gist of what happened in between broken sobs and sniffling. I saw Johnny's father's face go pale as he realized what I was trying to say. He quickly shushed me and went to look out the window. Johnny's mom went to the stove and collected a small pan of ashes. She then dumped out on the table and started dipping bullets into them, loading them into a 357. She was singing what I can only assume was a Denia prayer for protection and looking worried at me. They let me sleep inside and nothing more happened that night. In the morning they called the medicine man to come and pray over me. We still had a couple nights left but decided to call the trip short after that. Johnny said not to worry that the walkers wouldn't bother them anymore now that we were leaving and that he was just glad that I was okay. Suffice to say, I won't be going on any more caravans anytime soon. I know everyone says not to go searching for these things, these skinwalkers. Well, I can't tell you how much I regret not heeding that advice. Now, I spent a considerable amount of time on the Navajo Res in the past, so I thought I knew what I was doing. It's actually not that hard to find a skinwalker if you know what you're looking for. And if you do certain things, they'll come to you as long as you're in one of the active areas. Such areas are in the path of the skinwalker, as it were, where a local clan of skinwalkers will come together to hold counsel and carry out their various rites and rituals and plan their evil doings. Cayenta, Arizona is a town on the Navajo Nation at the intersection of Highway 160 and Highway 163. There's a pizza place there called Pizza Edge. Nearby is a car wash and a gas station as well as a couple other little fast food restaurants. The whole area is just dirt except for the mentioned highways which are paved. Anyways, I mention this because that's about all there is to Cayenta. That plus a high school and a couple small hotels, a church, a post office, and a grocery store. 
The houses consist mainly of Navajo style hoguns and double wide trailers. It all started in that small downtown area next to the pizza edge. As soon as I pulled into the small dirt parking lot, I noticed a Navajo man and a dog sitting in the shade. The man appeared to be asleep, but the dog was looking right at me, only its eyes were strange, vaguely human somehow. It was starting to get dark, so I went in to grab a slice of cheese pizza. When I returned, the dog was next to my car, standing on two legs and trying to get in my open windows. I shouted at the dog and it dropped back to all fours and scampered off. I didn't see the man anywhere, so I got in my car and drove out of town a couple of miles to find a place to park for the night. I had a garbage bag with which I had collected some roadkill along the way. I had found a dead coyote, a couple skunks, a raccoon, and a fox. I placed the dead animals out in a field where two natural draws met to form an open space next to a small pond. I had a hot cup of coffee and I was ready to stay up all night if need be. At some point, however, I did fall asleep and woke with a start when I realized it was the middle of the night and someone or something was walking around my car. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it out the window. Boy, do I wish I hadn't done that. There was that dog again, except it was walking on two legs, peering in at me. I froze up. I couldn't move a muscle. The dog was breathing on the window, causing it to fog up in the light. Its eyes just looked wrong, like a human's eyes in the face of a dog. I jumped into the driver's seat and try to start the car, but the engine wouldn't turn over. That thing was trying to open the door, and I could hear it scratching its claws along the side of my car. Finally, the engine turned over, and I was able to start the car. I hit the gas and sped out of there like a bat out of hell. I could see that dog thing in my rear view mirror, still running on two legs, before dropping back down onto all four legs and veering off into the night. I don't know what I was thinking, but that experience really scared me. Don't go looking for these things. They're out there, and they might just have you for dinner. The nighttime brought two rules we had to live by no matter what family you come from. You are to not look outside or be outside. This one night brought my brother to sneak out to meet a girl who lived nearby. Teenage stuff, if you get what I'm saying. Anyways, the later hours of the night and he's sneaking back through his window. As he's getting ready to pull himself in from the absolute darkness of the night, he heard my dog growling a few feet behind him. The dog we had at the time was from a known, highly aggressive breed, but to hear him growling came as a surprise to my brother. He claimed to call out soft to the dog, but the dog was unresponsive. After a few seconds, my brother slowly began walking towards the dog, and as he got closer, the smallest glint of light hit my dog's face. As his face softly lit, my brother realized that the dog was not looking at him, but the area of the roof right above his bedroom window. As he slowly turned and looked at the empty space, he began to recognize that heart-sinking feeling of somebody or something watching him. Along with the sounds like if something was sitting perched on the edge of the roof, the more time went by, the more dread he felt. He was so scared that he rushed through his window and to our mother, panicking and telling her what he did and what was going on. She was so scared she wasn't even bothered by the fact he snuck out. I remember watching and listening from my bedroom door 
and seeing her turn pale and begin to shake. She told him to never do it again and to keep his window closed. It was from that day on that not only our neighbors, but people from the complete opposite side of the community began to open up about their experiences with the thing that walks among us at night on the roofs of the house. One of which includes a close relative who was home alone with an aunt. One night, she claimed to begin hearing something clawing and walking on the roof. When she noticed it, she said it was like it noticed her or knew she was there because when she tried to find a room to shield herself in, the footsteps followed right above. Think of your ceiling made out of glass and this thing always knowing exactly where your foot is falling and the exact moment you extend your foot, there is another step. It wasn't until I reached my 20s that I began experiencing this creature on a weekly, yes, I said weekly, and I am not exaggerating. It was like clockwork, especially when snow began falling. Heavy footsteps before the sun was up that woke me up around 5 a.m. at least once a week. Here and there those footsteps would be substituted for what I only imagine is a grown man in steel toed boots running with what sounded like chains dragging. I was so desperate for sleep and to not be bothered that I started putting holy water on my ceiling but it seemed to only hold off whatever this being was for a few days before coming back again. As time went by, not only did my neighbor but the residents who lived several houses away would tell my family about their experiences with the thing that lurked on top of our houses. One neighbor was simply sitting in the living room when he began to hear like somebody was walking above him. He said it left him paralyzed with fear and all he could do was sit and stare in horror at the area above him. Another friend who lived three houses down was taking out her garbage when she heard walking right above her doorway and left her so scared she ran inside and refused to be out at night for months. I can go on and on about the stories that left our friends, family, and neighbors shaken to the core for hours, but for now, this seems to be the most nightmarish creatures our people have continuously shared the space with since we were forced into colonization. Even though these stories and these experiences can spark a lot of interest in seeking out these beings. I simply ask that no one actually take the time to. You never know what might follow you and make your home its home as well. Maybe those noises you hear in your attic at night when you're going to sleep are actually coming from your roof. And maybe it's something that has followed you already because of these stories and these experiences that you dig into. If you think you have one of these things making your home their home, I would recommend to call a priest or a medicine man, somebody who's familiar with these things, because if not, next time, it might be outside your window. Let me start off by saying my husband is native and this happened about six years before I met him. My ex-husband was stationed in San Diego and I flew out there to visit him. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to stay with him on the base for whatever reason. Don't ask me because I don't even know myself. Also, I should add I had just given birth about three months before this and I had my son with me. I found a hotel that wasn't far from the base and close to food and whatnot. I went out to get some food and then walked back to the hotel since it wasn't far. Unfortunately, with my horrible sense of direction, I got lost and ended up near a wooded area. But there was a highway also nearby. It was getting close to sunset and I started seeing sets of shining eyes and I thought they were just coyotes. I'm not afraid so much. After about 20 minutes, one set of shining eyes got closer and I saw it was a coyote. I remember watching Steve Irwin as a teenager 
And remember that if you make yourself appear bigger and more loud than you actually are, they will most of the time run off. So I started clapping my hands and shouting. This one, however, didn't. It actually stood up and started walking like a person. I have never run away from something so fast. It never followed me, and I wasn't going to stick around to find out what it was. It wasn't until I met my current husband that I found out what it was. And the look on his face when I told him this story, he actually went pale. He never said anything. He just kind of nodded like he understood. Maybe it knew I was still semi-healing from having recently given birth. Or it saw my son in the stroller I was pushing and just wanted to scare me. Either way, I don't know. I just know that it succeeded in scaring me. This isn't really a question. It's more or less me telling the story of how I saw a skinwalker. And I didn't even know what it was at the time. Back in college, a buddy and I were hanging out in our dorm room, smoking some weed and chilling. We got on the topic of creepy pastas and stuff, and I mentioned that I heard some really creepy skinwalker stories. That's when my buddy gets really quiet all of a sudden. I saw one, once, up close and personal. That shit is real, bro. Of course, I told him to tell me more but he said he didn't like talking about it, but eventually opened up. So his story took place back in the summer before he left for college. Him and his high school friend group had planned one big last camping trip. He was from Scottsdale, Arizona, and I think he said they only drove a good hour and a half outside the city to one of their friend's parents' ranching properties. There's about eight people in their group and everyone shows up around the same time in three separate cars. Around when they show up, it's already starting to get dark, so they set up their tents and a campfire and start drinking and smoking. There's one dude in their group, let's call him Tim, is being a little more quiet than usual. My buddy then asks, what's wrong? And he says something like, I don't feel good, just a little under the weather today. Regardless, they start making brats, and they're all having a good time. Then, out of nowhere, everyone notices that Tim is gone. Just totally vanished. Nobody even saw him leave, even though everyone was relatively close to the fire. The group starts calling his name, thinking that he's pranking everyone. Then, they start to get worried once Tim has been gone for over an hour. So my friend and a couple others go out into the hills to search for him. They walk around a good 15 minutes calling his name before they finally get a response. However, it's not Tim. They hear the familiar sound of a coyote and it's answered by a couple other coyotes. My buddy then says that he starts to get worried at this point that Tim might have gotten dragged off by some wild animals. Everyone in their group was paranoid because there's no way Tim could have gone missing without anyone noticing. Just simply no way. Then they hear another howl, but it's longer than the others and different in that it sounds off. Like if someone had a recording of a coyote and decided to play it. My friend's blood ran cold when the howl ended in a sort of hacking laughter. And unlike the coyotes, this laughter sounded close. Like 20 feet away close. The group then starts looking around, convinced that Tim is out there fucking with them. After a few minutes, they return to the fire a little shaken up. Everyone is really starting to get worried at this point. The group starts considering calling the police when suddenly a truck pulls up to the campsite. It happens to be Tim's truck. Then Tim steps out of it and is wondering why everyone has been freaking out. Tim says that he's sorry 
that he got off work two hours late and hurried out to the ranch as fast as he could. Then, that's when the group realizes that Tim didn't carpool there with anyone. All of a sudden, they hear another long, drawn out coyote sound. At that point, the group decided to get out of there. They then ended up paying to camp in a designated campground and the night went on as normal. But my friend still says he thinks about when he asked him if he was alright. He claims that at the time he could definitely tell something was off about Tim. But they didn't think anything of it. But now he's 100% convinced that quote unquote Tim was some sort of skinwalker entity copying his friend for shits and giggles. How the creature knew what Tim looked and sounded like. Well, he has no explanation for that. Maybe it just got inside their heads. So be careful when you go camping with some friends out in the woods and one of them starts acting strange. This person might actually not be your friend. This incident took place when I was 17. I was with my family. We were going through the mountains near Window Rock, Arizona. It was late at night and all around us as we drove was darkness and tall trees. We were in a pickup truck. I was sitting in the front with my sister and her husband who was driving. My two brothers and cousin were sitting back in the bed. All of a sudden, this thing or creature runs out in front of us and across the headlights. At the moment I thought it was a deer. My brother-in-law, Eddie, said it was a coyote. It happened so fast, but just in case, we do say a prayer. After a few minutes we soon forgot about it, driving along and talking. When up in front of us, there, just standing in the middle of the county road, are four more coyotes. Now, I've seen a lot of coyotes out where we live, but rarely do we see them more than two at a time, and even less sitting in the road. Eddie slows the truck, but they stay right there almost as if they're daring him. Then, when it looks like he's going to have to stop or hit them, they walk away towards the shoulder and disappeared into the trees. Eddie then makes a remark that something spooky is going on and he wants to get home as soon as possible. But my sister tells him better safe than sorry and not to go too fast. Now the only thing worse to us Navajos than coyotes appearing out of nowhere is the hoot of the owl. Well most of the time it's no big deal. Just all looking birds hunting for mice. When you hear them the way we did, something's not right. It could mean that someone close to you is in danger. The fact is, if they are hunting, they are most likely quiet. Anyways, we start hearing these owl hoots, one after the other, as if they are calling ahead, alerting some dark entity that we are on our way. More curious than that, there were six of us in that truck, and I know I counted six hoots. The turnoff from the county road is a dirt road, and it is less than 10 minutes from our house. Eddie is driving along going a little faster than my sister is comfortable with. Looking back over my shoulder, I can see the rest of them there in the bed, bouncing and sliding around a little bit. Only a minute or two down the road, we can see the lights from the houses still in the distance, but close enough where we're all feeling better about things. But before we get there, Eddie slams on the brakes and yanks the truck to the left. I see something big and black and definitely upright right in front of us. Despite Eddie's efforts, the truck runs right into it. 
We hit it so hard that it sounded like a gun going off. I was holding on tight to the door and seat, but I could hear the rest of my family being thrown around in the back. They were screaming and cursing. Eddie then managed to get control of the vehicle pretty fast. When it stopped, I jumped out to make sure my two brothers and my cousin were okay. They were only banged up a little bit, which is more than I can say for the pickup. The whole nose was total. The only thing still intact was one headlight, which was still lit up. As we're standing around the truck, we're all looking to the right of the road, where less than six feet away is this six foot high chain link fence that runs along the shoulder in both directions as far as the eye can see. The woods beyond the fence go all the way back into the hills. The point is that there is no way that whatever we hit took off in that direction or even came at us from that way. Basically, it came out of nowhere as if it loomed up from the surface of the road itself or dropped down out of the sky. Meanwhile, Eddie was taking a closer look at the damage. It was, after all, his truck. He noticed that there was some skin, hair, and blood on what remained of the grill, along the lip of the hood, and even by the light fixture that was broken, convinced that whatever it was, it was hurt and possibly crumpled up nearby. We looked around up and down the road and off to the shoulder to the left, but we found nothing. As it was really dark and things were kind of eerie, we decided we would come back when the sun was up and look around. We all piled back in the truck, but Eddie couldn't get it to start. He would turn the key in the ignition and not even get a sound as if there was no battery. The funny thing though, is that one headlight was still on. Go figure. No sooner had Eddie finished cursing and punching the steering wheel, when we hear off in the darkness, and in the trees to the left, some whistling and laughing, as if someone is playing games with us. One second it seems to be coming from over here, the next second from over there and then after that from back a ways. It went on like this for like 10 minutes. My sister tells us that it's a skinwalker and then she starts whispering Navajo prayers. By this time only my sister is still in the truck. Eddie and I are standing by the bed on the driver's side and my other two brothers and cousin are in bed. My older brother, Nicky, is unafraid. He thinks that it's just some idiot in the woods and volunteers to run to the house and come back with my father's car. The house is less than a mile away. No sooner does he start jogging off, we hear the same laughing and whistling go with him as if he is being followed. He told us later that he was aware of it. And even though he thought he heard his name being whispered, he just kept jogging along all the same. About 10 minutes later, we see these headlights coming towards us. It was Nikki. When we all got back to the house, Eddie called the sheriff to report the accident. It was super late, but he told Eddie he would meet him there and have a look just in case somebody did get hit. I went back with Eddie in my dad's car the sheriff showed up a few minutes later. He had one of those industrial flashlights, but as much as he looked around, he couldn't find anything either. He agreed by the look of the hair left behind that whatever we hit, it wasn't a deer. When we told him about the whistling and laughing, his whole demeanor sort of changed. It was obvious that he was no longer interested in standing out there in the dark. He went back to his car and wrote out one of those little accident reports and gave it to Eddie. The next day my mother had a friend of hers come to the Hogan. She was this really old woman that we were afraid of of when we were kids. She had this small crystal, sort of pale yellow in color that she held up and looked through. 
as if she could see into the past. She told my mother there was a fierce battle of wills between a local medicine man and a skinwalker last night. And that if it wasn't for the medicine man distracting the skinwalker, all six of us would have died when the truck went out of control and hit the trees. She never did tell us who that medicine man was or the skinwalker, though she did tell us that she knew them both. And interesting enough, when Eddie went back for the truck the next morning, it started right up without a problem. So if you're ever traveling through a Navajo res or Navajo nation or around here at night, pray to whatever gods you have that your car does not stop and that you don't run into any dog, coyote, deer, or any animal. This encounter takes place in Chinle, Arizona, at our house. The five of us, a school friend, two cousins, my sister and I, were all in high school at the time. We were hanging out and everyone decided to spend the night because it was the middle of the summer and it was so hot. We set up our folks van and my older brother's pickup truck so we could sleep outside where there was at least a bit of a breeze. We spent most of the earlier part of the night doing what teenagers do, including a little smoke, if you know what I mean, and also a couple of beers. Sometime after midnight, the three girls decided to call it a night and climbed into the bed of the pickup truck. My friend and I stayed out on the porch for another hour or so before heading to the van. We must have dozed off soon afterwards. According to my sister, she's a year younger than me. She is still awake, just lying there and looking up at the stars. The sky out here is really clear at night. There are stars everywhere. When out of nowhere, the neighbor's dogs from across the dry bed start to bark, which around here means that the local wildlife is out and about. My sister says she is listening between the sounds of the dogs to see if she can hear what's out there. Black against black, she suddenly sees this figure crouched on the roof of the pickup and staring down at her. She becomes absolutely frozen, partially out of fear and partially through no will of her own. She wants to scream or at least say something, but she can't find her voice. It's as if she's gasping for air, but without making any noise, and as if her lungs just won't fill. Just then, our younger cousin wakes up. She says because out of nowhere she gets this feeling of intense dread. She sits up kind of suddenly, and at the same time, it is like my sister is released from a spell. The air rushes into her lungs, and she lets out a scream pointing to the top of the truck, but whatever it was is now gone. All three girls are now wide awake and panicking. They jump out of the back of the pickup and make for the house where my parents are sound asleep. My friend and I, totally oblivious to the excitement and somewhat under the influence, remain blissfully unconscious. Inside the house, my sister tells the other girls what she saw or at least thinks she saw. At first they're all scared, but then they just start laughing. Then they become brave. My sister grabs a flashlight from the kitchen drawer and the three of them venture out into the dark yard. They come off the porch and paint the front of the property with the beam of the flashlight. They see nothing of interest. Now they head towards the back of the house, all together as if the light is some kind of shield. As the beam moves across the open yard and then to the hill of the back of the property, they see this figure moving quickly and steady, but in an awkward way, as if it has a new pair of shoes making its way to the top. Before they can get a good look, it disappears over and down to the other side. My sister wants to go after it, 
but my two cousins pull her back towards the house. They go inside and wake up my parents. My mother refuses to leave the house, but my father, thinking that he's got some sort of thief running around his property, grabs his shotgun, 20 gauge, and makes for the hill. Of course, whoever or whatever it is, is no longer to be seen. He fires off two shots into the darkness anyway. Not that she needs to after those two shotgun blasts. But my sister then comes over to the van to wake us up to go inside the house. The only thing I'm asking is why the old man is blasting away into the night. She tells me her story. My friend, who definitely party harder than I did, doesn't stir an inch. I told my sister I'm staying where I am. So the three girls decide they too are staying outside and set up watch. All three girls promise they won't fall asleep. Nevertheless, the two cousins are soon nodded out and my sister is again alone with the stars. She says it's no more than 20 minutes, if even that many, when she hears what sounds like someone talking to themselves in Navajo. But it's old Navajo and she doesn't know what's being said. The sound is coming from back by the hill. My sister wakes up the other two girls and they run back up to the house. My sister makes her way back to my parents' room. My dad is out like a light and not responding. My mother, however, is talking in her sleep as if she's admonishing someone. At the same time, she is invoking the name of Jesus. We are Christian after all. The next morning, my sister is asking her if she remembers any of it. My mother recalls having a dream in which something dark and menacing is outside the door trying to find its way in. She has no doubt it was evil, but she says that the prayer she did made it go away. Anyways, at the same time my mother is talking in her sleep, my sister feels a presence to the back door of the house of something she describes as evil. All three girls swear there's a heavy smell of something dead, which makes them nauseous. No sooner does my mother name Jesus, the feeling and the smell go away. When morning comes and the sun is up high and bright, the three girls and my mother go outside and have a look around. There, up on the hill is a spot in the high grass that's all flat, as if something was sitting there but there are no trails, tracks, or footprints of any kind. As they all come back to the house, my sister leaves the group and goes to the pickup where she left her sandals. She finds upon one of them a clump of long black hair, frizzy and tangled. All of the girls, including my mother, have dark hair, but none of them like that clump. She shows it to my mother who tells her to immediately throw it into the fire of the stove. She tells her it is the mark of a skinwalker who intends to do bad medicine and must be destroyed. A woman living in White River, Arizona comes home late at night from running an errand she pulls up her driveway, gets out of the vehicle, and using her keychain, opens the garage door. Just as it's going up, she hears something run up at her back. As she turns, she sees this dark shadowy figure slip in behind her husband's truck, which is in the driveway and to her left. The only thing that she sees is that it has patches of short, scraggly hair and the feet that she saw don't look like they belong to anything that's human. She runs into the garage and into the house, screaming for her husband. He comes out the house and checks all around, but he finds nothing. He does tease her a bit and tells her that she shouldn't let her imagination get the better of her. However, only minutes later, a friend who the husband is expecting arrives. 
He's all excited and somewhat upset. He explains that as he was coming towards the house. Some two-legged creature. He says it looked like a skinny bear. Only really scraggly and skinny. With its mouth and teeth exposed. Almost like it was drunk. It came stumbling out of the trees and straight into the side of his SUV. He slammed on his brakes, but when he got out to look, there was nothing on the road or off to the shoulder. The two then go out to have a look at the SUV, and sure enough, there's a small dent and some black hair stuck to the rear fender on the driver's side and some hair in the bumper, but there's no blood. I'm going to start this off by saying it's a long read, but it's worth it. My friend and I were talking about this creepy experience we had, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. So I figure I'll turn to Reddit for some answers, if there are any. People might think that this is fake, but I don't care whether you believe it or not. I have no clue if this animal or creature is a skinwalker or just a very creepy animal. This took place around 2019 and I do live in Tennessee right on the outskirts of the Appalachian Mountains. So here it goes. Two of my friends and I were driving on a desolated back road at night. We were jamming to music and talking. Everything was normal. I was driving. My friend Hannah was in the passenger seat being the DJ and our friend Chris was in the back seat behind me. Hannah was trying to pull up a song on YouTube that wasn't on Spotify. So it was silent for a bit. While she was waiting on the website to load, Chris and I were still talking. We then came up on a small animal in the road, but I didn't think anything of it. Well, I expected the animal to move pretty quickly once it saw us coming down the road, but it didn't. As I got closer, I slowed down to let the animal have enough time to run off, but it still stayed very still. It almost looked frozen, and the closer I got, I could make out that it looked like some kind of cat. The only thing was, it didn't look like any sort of cat I ever seen. It looked like it had fur, but the fur was flesh colored. Its ears were very small, almost like the ears of a kitten, even though it was only a tiny bit bigger than a house cat. It was laying in a way that looked like the Sphinx was facing us. The scariest thing about it though was its eyes. Not to sound over dramatic, but its eyes literally looked like the pits of hell were burning inside of them. They were bright red, orange-like, and had twinkles of yellow in them that reflected off the headlights. As we got closer, the whole car was silent, and I just stared ahead. This cat scared the shit out of me, and it still wasn't moving. I felt a huge pit in my stomach and began having intense anxiety. It was almost like I was frozen, but I was not about to stop to figure out what this cat was. At this point, I had to steer around a bit to pass it without hitting it. I was like three inches away from touching this thing, and as I slowly crept by it, I watched it through the window the entire time. And it didn't even flinch, and the eyes still had the same glow even without my headlights directly on it. After we passed it, about five seconds later, Chris yells, What the fuck was that? I immediately start freaking out and shout, I don't know. Hannah looks up from her phone and says, What? What did y'all see? She looked behind us and kept asking. We explained what happened and she said, I didn't see anything behind us. Chris and I looked back and sure enough, it was gone. We drove up the road to a church and turned around in the parking lot. We now wanted to get back to Hannah's as soon as possible. When we got back, 
We rushed in and told her mom what we saw. But we didn't mention that it looked like a cat. We described it as a small animal. Her mother stops for a minute and says, Was it a cat? We were blown away. We told her it was. And she said that her and a cousin came across the same exact thing when they were teens. Only, it was in a different area and they saw it peeking out of the bushes. She still to this day doesn't know what it was and she said that she thinks about it from time to time, even after 30 years. So I guess I want to know a few things. What was this? It didn't look like a bobcat, mountain lion, or fox. Is it a demon, skinwalker, wendigo, or unknown creature? I heard all of the legends regarding the woods at night. Don't look up in the trees. Don't respond if your mother calls your name. But everyone I have told this to tells me it was most likely a scared bobcat or that they never heard of anything else before. So if anyone makes it this far and has some answers, I would greatly appreciate any answers. This happened directly to me at the time of the story. I was a 12 year old male who lived in California. For a summer trip, me and my family flew to Idaho for a week to stay with my cousins. We stayed at their house for two days, then came the best part, until what happened, that is. On the third day, we drove to a small city in the Rocky Mountains of central Idaho. They owned a cabin. The first day was fishing at nearby lakes, playing games, and meeting a few of the neighbors on the small street. Everyone we met was nice. It was amazing. I thought nothing could go wrong. Let me stop here and before I say more, here's a layout of the area. The room where I slept was at the back of the house. There was no fence at the back of the backyard because it was on the bank of a freezing cold river. Directly on the other side of the river was a huge mountain covered by a thick forest of pine trees. A small path starts on the other side of the river, but there's no bridge. But there is a bridge a quarter of a mile down the road in front of our house. I went to bed that night and I woke up around 2 in the morning needing to use the bathroom. I got up and did my thing then headed back to my room. As I got into bed I felt hot so I opened my window. Not even 15 minutes after I opened my window I heard the most terrifying screech come from the forest. It was raspy but a high pitched voice. I know for a fact it wasn't human. I heard plenty of stories from YouTube channels that often describe creatures that make weird noises that sound sort of human, but aren't. I heard it once more but this time, closer. I eventually fell asleep after not hearing it for a while again. In the morning when I woke up, we explored the town. At around 7pm, me and my sister and my cousins got permission from our parents to go explore the forest. I felt uneasy considering the creepy human-like noises in the night that I was hearing. The oldest cousin Alex, who was 16, took a loaded pistol, a lighter, and backpack of snacks. I carry a hunting knife and a flashlight. The cousin my age, Julia, took just a flashlight. My sister Brianna and the other cousin Karina, who were both 10, took some extra batteries and a small bag of candy each. We made our way across the bridge at the end of the street and back to the path on the side of the river across from the house. All of us began the hike to the top of the mountain. We made it to the top of the mountain in an hour and a half. The view from 9,000 feet was incredible. We then stayed a little bit longer up there and at 8.55 Alex and I figured it was time to head down and we ordered the group to the path. At this time, it was dark now, and the sun had fully set. Julia and I turned on our flashlights and shined them ahead as we walked. When we were halfway down the mountain, which was about 45 minutes into the walk, I got this dreadful feeling you get when you're being watched and followed. Seconds later, 
I heard something coming from the bushes a few yards into the side of the path that we were walking on. I brushed it off as some type of small animal. And about five minutes after this, we heard a noise and it gripped me with fear and my heart dropped to my stomach. It was that same horrifying screech from last night echoing through the forest from a mile or two away. I told everyone we needed to move faster. And we did. The noise went off again, but closer, and again, and closer. Whatever that thing was, it was moving faster than us. We were full on speed walking by then, but it still wasn't fast enough because soon the screeching stopped, and we heard loud steps 30 yards off to the right. I got that feeling that I was being watched again. Alex took his gun and fired two shots in the general direction of the steps. The creature backed off, but even though we thought it was gone, I still sensed we were being watched. As the river came into sight, it caught me and everyone else by surprise. I heard the path of gravel crunching behind us. As I looked back into the darkness, I saw the outline of something that resembled a human. I told Alex and his face went pale when he looked. We told the rest of the group quietly and on three, we all broke out into a run towards the river. Whatever that thing was, it was extremely fast. When we reached the river, we figured there wasn't enough time to get to the bridge, which was still a quarter of a mile further along the side of the river. So we jumped in and swam across the ice cold water. This thing got to the river just as we made it up to the bank and into the backyard. Julia and I shined our flashlights and finally got a good look at it. It was a massive, hairy creature that was about seven feet tall. It had huge, razor sharp claws like a bear. Its eyes glowed red when the flashlight shined on them. Alex then took a shot at it and it darted off within one final screech. We all looked at each other scared. Alex then explained everything to our parents. They didn't know what to make of it and had never heard of anything like it. I'm thankful that nothing happened to us and also that I had noticed the creature behind us. If I hadn't, one of the others might not have noticed it until it was too late. The next time I stay at that cabin, I'm never going into those woods again. This story comes from Gallup, New Mexico. Family members are inside their home and getting ready for bed. All of a sudden, the dogs outside start raising a ruckus. The man of the family, including an uncle and some nephews, go outside to investigate. Concerned about coyotes getting into the hen house, they think they see something moving about within the trees to the back of the house. The uncle picks up a handful of rocks and throws one after another into the trees. However, they hear or see nothing further outside of the ordinary. And so they end up returning to the house. With everything normal, the night is quiet and the dogs have stopped barking. They decide it's safe to go into bed. Just then, they hear a loud rustle from the trees, from the limbs whipping and branches snapping. They rush back out to the yard. All is quiet again. For 30 minutes or so, they stand guard, but not even the wind is blowing. The next morning, they go back outside and see that the gate to the hen house, as well as the door, is wide open. All of the birds are gone. The men end up searching the yard and out by the outhouse. They discover, instead, an odd set of tracks going back and forth as if something upon two feet was pacing between there and the trees. Finding no signs of the chickens, they return to the area around the hen house to look for similar tracks, knowing that only one person or someone similar could have opened the gate and the door. But the only marks they find are within the pen and they all belong to chickens.
The grandmother, who is standing at the back door of the house, tells them that it was a skinwalker. She says a prayer, and together they yell in a loud voice and in Navajo, Go away, go bother someone else. It all started when summer came, and me and my three friends, Leah, Kathy, and Jennifer, were all planning to go camping. Leah asked her dad if he could drop us off, and he agreed. When the next day came, we started heading up. Leah's dad had set up the camper that we were using. He told us there were some spare blankets inside, in case we got cold. Leo's dad finally got into his truck and turned around. He stopped and rolled down his window and said, No boys, to all of us. He then gave us a smile to let us know he was joking with us and drove off. There was three rooms, one master bedroom and two rooms with bunks. Each room had a TV in it, so nobody cared what room they got. Everyone knew that Jennifer didn't like small rooms. So we ended up letting her have the big room. I was in the room with Leah and Kathy was in a room by herself. I started unpacking when we heard a loud noise outside. Leah, did you hear that? Hear what? That noise? We both looked at each other, startled, and then continued unpacking. But something seemed off. It was the fact that Leah was so chill about it. I was done unpacking so I walked outside and started a fire. Jennifer walked out, and then she asked if I saw it. I responded with, saw what? That's when she started freaking me out. She then started staring at me, but behind me, panicking. Her eyes started back and forth, and then she was calm. I felt as if something was watching me, so I turned around, and I saw an orb in the corner of my eye reddish, black, but by the time I turned around to fully look, it was gone. I was so freaked out because we were in the middle of nowhere, you can say, and it was only the three of us by ourselves. I then told Kathy that she could cook instead. We had her family secret recipe of shepherd's pie and a bunch of vanilla cupcakes. There were about a dozen cupcakes left in the open box, so we just left it on the table and went to bed. I could hear the TV coming from Kathy's room, so I punched the wall and told her to be quiet. Right after I said it, everything went quiet. But then, there was a small scream in the distance. It didn't sound human. It gave me chills that ran down my spine. But I ended up dozing off. But then, I woke up in the middle of the night hearing noises like if someone was in the kitchen. I wake up Leah and then we walk out into a small hallway that led into the kitchen. We saw Jennifer sitting on the table just staring straight ahead with Kathy being right behind me. We were looking at her and Jennifer was making weird noises, weird sounds. She was really creeping us out. She never did this or stared into space this often. But then I noticed something in the corner of my eye. It was a shadow. It was staring at Jennifer. And then it slowly turned to face me and Kathy. I froze. Kathy froze. Then Jennifer looked at us as if she was being mind controlled. And then this figure or shadow ran out the window and Jennifer dropped her head into the table. We were trying to wake her up afterwards but she wouldn't wake up. This experience still scares me to this day and it is only one of the creepiest things I have ever seen. Me and the others are still very close friends. We even live together now but we all remember that night and whatever it was that we saw. It turns out that Jennifer remembers seeing it in the daytime, but she says she doesn't remember anything when nighttime came and when we saw it. 
It freaks us out even more now, knowing that our friend wasn't even awake and staring into space with her eyes wide open. So I want to first say that I don't know much about skinwalkers and other creatures of similar nature. I just now started learning of their potential existence. So now I'm willing to learn and be educated even more on these topics, especially ever since I came across something at night. There's this park my girlfriend and I, we used to go to smoke there a lot. And we encountered this same dog-like thing multiple times. And it was always at night. It looked like a really huge black dog with round bear-like ears and yellowish eyes. The first few times we saw it, we didn't think much of it. But then we noticed that it kept just like spawning in. It never made a sound. And it always just stared at us. And it would follow us around the park in a creepy way. And just an FYI, we encountered this dog while we were high and while sober on many different occasions. Anyways, we ended up not going to that park no more. But before we stopped going, one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me happened at that park. We were walking from the parking lot to the park and we would just see this thing emerge from behind a tree and follow us and try to block our path back to the car. Sometimes we had to run and jump a fence just to get away from it. We never had a single dangerous interaction outside of this one time we were at the deepest corner of the park that was bordering a small forest and we had to jump about two fences to avoid that thing. I do have a theory. It could be a stray, but it really did not act like a dog at all. It didn't even feel alive. I felt like it was just actually watching us for some reason, but it was really eerie. I'll never forget that night. I am a park ranger, and that is all you will learn about me, aside from this story. During the summer of 2008, I had been assigned to a watchtower in the middle of a heavily forest area. Most nights, it was uneventful, and I tended to just read a book as I waited for my shift to end. However, this night, when I started my shift, the guy I took over from was shaken up, concerned. I asked what was wrong. All he did was shake his head and said, there are things in the woods. He didn't say anything else and just left me standing there like a jackass jerk. Well, I set up for the night and took out my book. It was the mailman and I found myself surprised by how much I enjoyed it. Sometime around an hour into my shift, something struck the window. I jumped up and quickly sat the book down. Before checking it out, I had expected it was either a big bug or some poor bird. It was a bird alright, but not what I had been expecting at all. This bird was dead long before it had collided with the window. Both wings torn right off and stripped of all feathers. It was bound together with straps made from long grass blades. This was the clear evidence that this was man-made. I quickly took out my flashlight and began scanning the area beneath me. I couldn't see much through the woods. However, as I did a quick double take, I swear, I saw a dark shape dart away from the light. I feel this needs some elaborating. I could barely make out anything. But when I brought my light over this thing, I only got a brief glimpse. 
I literally couldn't describe it for the life of me. This thing was fast. Too fast. Alright, listen up you punks. If you're out there, show yourself right now. I used my most commanding voice possible. Nothing. As I drew my pistol, I heard the radio crackle. Naturally, I went to check and picked up the receiver. As I held it up to my ear, I could only hear static, so I at first assumed there was a glitch. But right as I decided to set it down, something stopped me. Call it intuition, something just wasn't right. And then I realized what it was. I could hear something over the radio. It was faint, so I really had to strain to hear it. Slowly, I could make out what sounded like faint, low humming. There was a pattern to it. A steady beat that started low, building up, then carefully dropped back down in an instant. I don't know how long I was listening to that humming sound, but eventually I turned off the radio, ready to radio it in. Then I realized I could still hear the humming. Without a second thought, I drew my pistol and turned around on my heel before steadily walking back outside. That humming sound sounded like it was all around me. Following that same pattern, I still had a strain to make it out, but there was no question it was there. I swiveled around, pistol aimed at empty air. Every part of me was screaming to call for backup, but I wasn't sure what I needed backup for. I needed some proof of what I was dealing with, so I waited, on guard and ready, and then it stopped. As I became accustomed to the silence, I couldn't hear anything, not even a bug chirping. Cautiously, turning my flashlight back on, I pointed it down at the base of the tower. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Then, I heard a creak. I immediately spun around, processing this information. At first, I dismissed it as the wood, but then, there was another creak, and another. Something was up here with me. It took me a few moments to realize that it was just around the corner. In that moment, fight or flight kicked in full gear. And I chose fight. I rounded the corner and found nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was nervous, but I still had a job to do. And with no other option, I decided to call for backup which I should have done that a long time ago. I realized that when I saw the receiver had been cut right off, I stared, dumbfounded by a few moments before grabbing my walkie-talkie instead. But when I turned it on, all I got was a harsh whine right in my ear, which caused me to drop it as I recovered. Once I had, I immediately tried to find it, but it was gone. My situation was desperate. I was now completely cut off with some thing or other that seemed to defy all sense. If I was going to make it out of this, I had to stay put and wait for someone to come check on me. I still had my pistol drawn, waiting and waiting. I then quickly shined my flashlight outside one last time. And this time, I finally saw them standing among the trees, staring up at me. They had been avoiding me all this time, so to see so many of them, you might be wondering what they were. And I'd rather not tell you for my sake. I was at my limit then and screamed, turning off my flashlight and pointing my gun right at the door. There, I stayed for the rest of my shift unwilling to move from that spot. I consider it a miracle 
I lasted for the rest of my shift. By the time someone finally arrived to see why I wasn't checking in, I poured out every single thing I had gone through. At first, the other ranger looked at me like I was crazy, but when he asked if I had any proof, something landed on the roof of his vehicle. It was another dead, naked, and wingless bird wrapped in grass. Needless to say, we booked it right out of there. When I got back and made a report about what happened, I demanded to speak with the last guy who had been on the previous ship. I really wanted him to have it for not warning me of what was out there. But here's the thing, we never found him. We searched high and low, checked every single record for a trace. We tried to look up his name if when we could remember it, but it seemed like he never existed in the first place. So what the hell took his shift? Many of you who love paranormal stuff may have already heard of the word Nagual here in Mexico. And I would guess that also on some other countries in Latino America, we call that way people who can shapeshift into animals. Well, here's my story. It was a cold night. I remember because it was really weird for it to get cold on that side of the country. This was in my parents' house, in a small pueblo, or small town. And back in the day, it was one of the last houses outside of town. Not so many neighbors, but a lot of trees and nature around. The house has a long backyard, where we used to have sheep. At one side, a small water stream, and trees to the other side. The sheep then started to bleat very loud, something we could call screams. My father then went to give a check on a window in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly, and in a low, urgent voice, he told my mom, Ve agarra a tu padre y a tus hermanos y diles que vengan ya ahorita. Go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. They were four brothers my grandfather and my father. When everyone was there a few minutes later, my father started to tell us what he saw. In the barn, we had 10 sheep. At the moment, my father gave a look. All of them were together in just one corner. At the center, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense but he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one sheep there. This one sheep was screaming really bad. Then, my grandfather told my mom to keep us inside of the house and to keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. So he made some kind of prayer holding his machete. So his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. He then went outside. That's when my grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, Vete de aquí. No tienes nada que ver aquí. Deja esta casa. Go away. You have nothing to do here. Leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming, by the way. And when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and raise its head up towards my family. This thing was only staring at them. Not a single noise. And also no red or shining eyes. Only the shadow looked like it was looking at them. So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock. He picked it up from the ground and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation, but I guess this thing was not that strong 
or maybe because it was six of us and we all had machetes but when the rock hit it this being turned his back and ran away to the forest running on all four legs like an animal would they then approached the sheep and my grandpa said how the sheep was on the ground but it was still alive but it was completely unskinned it was horrifying at least my grandfather then sacrificed it to stop the suffering after that night a family friend told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was a Nagwat. he told us he spoke to that man and he told him to leave the town Indeed, we never happened to live something similar after that. I saw some videos about skinwalkers on TikTok. So I started watching videos about them on YouTube. And there was a whole podcast where this guy just read stories about them from Reddit and other stories that people submitted. Our ward at church purchased a piece of land way back in the day. It's seriously just wooded area with a little bit of swamp. We would always go there for campouts and scouts and at night when it was pitch black we would all play manhunt. Well one time we all got down to one person whose name was David. Growing up, he was super fast and he would hide really good so nobody could ever find him. He would always end up being the last person. Well, one time, it was down to David and we had split up and gone way deep in the forest towards the swamp because it seems like it was impossible to find him. We thought he might have gone a little bit further than we normally go. We started getting into some more muddy and wet terrain as we get closer to a swamp-like area where the water is most likely shin deep. And we saw David way out in the swamp and he wasn't wearing a shirt. And with the spotlight on him, he looked super pale, but he just stood there and didn't say a word. You could seriously tell something was off. Then, all of a sudden, we heard David from behind us, yelling, trying to get our attention, so we would keep trying to chase him down. Meaning, what we saw in front of us was definitely not him. So being a bunch of 12 to 17 year old boys, we started yelling and running back to the campsite as fast as we could. Nobody believed us. In fact, for years everybody made fun of it, calling the ghost of David. But then I started listening to these stories and every single one of them sounds just like what happened in some way or another. I am Navajo. We had an incident with an unwelcome visitor in our home. Here's what happened. My cousin is sleeping over. He's the same age as me. We're both 13 at this time. We're in my room talking and hanging out. It is around maybe 11 p.m. It is a pleasant summer evening. So my window is wide open. It's also pretty dark outside and my dad is in the living room watching TV. But as always, he's dozed off on the couch. My mom has already gone to bed. My cousin and I are keeping it down, but we're not ready yet to call it a night. All of a sudden, we hear the screen door to the front of the house open and slam shut. We think it's my dad, my mom, she tells us the next day she hears footsteps on the carpet. Whoever it is, she says, goes through her room and towards the bathroom. So she naturally assumes it's my dad. 
Then she realizes that she's unable to move, as if she's paralyzed. Still, in my room, my cousin and I again hear the screen door open and slam, only this time more loud. It wakes up my dad, and he comes to my bedroom to check on us. Finding us both there, he wants to know which one of my friends just slipped out of the house. It takes a few minutes, but we convince him we were by ourselves, and that we thought it was him going in and out. I can see by the look on his face, he's not really buying it. But he has to admit, we don't seem to be lying. He then leaves, and as he's closing the door to my room, he tells us to stay out of trouble and go to sleep. All we could do is shrug. The next morning, my mom tells us about what she heard and how she could not move. She also tells us that the second time the door slams, she then hears what sounds like a horse galloping by her bedroom window. She then has all of us pray, and now, every year, we hike up the mountain to a high point and we pray for protection from evil. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona, within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation, were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape, materializing from the darkness itself, loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later, on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limp, and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house, and they summoned the local medicine man, who came and said some prayers over him, but he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and blessed the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body. I was only 17 at the time. On this specific night, I woke up feeling thirsty. I'm just lying there, staring into the dark and deciding if it's worth the effort to get up and get something to drink. I'm sure we all been in that situation plenty of times before. So tonight, 
when you're in bed and you're questioning if you should get up and get some water, remember this story. So all I can hear is the clock ticking down the hallway and the muted silence. It's just way too quiet. I checked the time on my cell phone. It's a few minutes short of 2.30 a.m. I then decide to sit up and get out the bed. I then make my way towards the door of my bedroom. It's really dark. I go down the hallway towards the kitchen. As I get out to the living room, I chance to look to my right and in the direction of the front door to the house. The only light is coming from a street light that is down at the end of the property and not all that far away. There, at the inside of the door, inside the house, I see this figure standing there. Its face at first appears human, then serpent-like, and then back to human, as if it can't decide how it wants to present itself to me. For some reason, I'm just standing there taking this all in. I'm not afraid, but I don't feel like I have any control over my senses either. And I'm not sure if I could move or have said anything, even if I wanted to, which at the time, I can't say I did. As the two of us are standing face to face, he assumes his human features. His face is fully painted, a thick stripe of black across his eyes and the rest white. He has a feather woven into the hair at the top of his head. He looks young, not much older than me. He is bare chested, not real muscular, but definitely cut. His torso is painted red. His lower half is covering what looks to be khaki colored pants, well worn and faded, cut off and frayed just below the knees. He is barefooted, but his wrists and ankles are wrapped with animal skin of some sort. It is hairy and light, colored like that of a coyote. He doesn't say anything to me, not aloud anyway, but I do hear his words in my head. Although for the life of me, I can't remember any of it. It's as if he at the same time, with this cold stare of his, is pinching away layers of my memory. I do remember wondering why he is in my house and having the idea that he was expecting to find someone else. Just then, without even thinking about it, my cell phone in my hand, I begin dialing 911. With the phone ringing, I look back to the painted stranger. He gives me a thin smile and vanishes through the door, which by the way, is closed and locked. To the other side, I hear what sounds like a horse galloping away. I move over to the door and pull it open. I see this figure taking long strides across my yard, away from the light and out into the street. There's a car parked on the other side. He goes around to the passenger side, ducks down and into the car, and it drives off. It all happens in a matter of seconds. I then realize there's a police operator talking back to me from the phone. I tell her there was someone in my house, but I leave out the part about his changing appearance and leaving through a closed door. The operator, or whoever she was, tells me not to worry about it. She says that I'm not the first caller of this kind on this night. She tells me to say a prayer, telling me that she too is Navajo and to go back to bed and that I won't be bothered by it anymore. When I was younger, my mom would take us on a road trip to her hometown on the Navajo reservation. I would always ask her to tell me a skinwalker story along the way. I remember every story she's told me was when we were driving through miles of nothing at night. Lucky for us, Nothing ever happened to us during those drives. Anyways, this is one of those stories that came from my aunt. 
So my auntie and some of her friends used to party a lot back in the day. They would hop in an old van, drive out to the boondocks, and just drink and have fun. Of course, this all took place on the Navajo reservation after sunset. But on this specific night, that's what they were doing. Everything was going good and whatnot. When all of a sudden, they hear what sounds like rocks being thrown at their van. Everyone gets quiet as they wonder what the hell is going on. The sounds of rocks being thrown stops. And then, something jumps on top of the van roof. I should mention, my family owned a white van that we would use for road trips because it had enough room for my brothers and me. So imagine young me being told the story in a van. Terrifying, I know. So everyone starts panicking and they all hurry to lock all the doors. My auntie jumps in the driver's seat and tries to start the engine. At this moment, of course, the old van then refuses to start. And whatever is on the roof is still up there making banging noises at this point. It sounds like it's jumping up and down. My auntie is freaking out when she sees a hand with long nails reach over the roof and start scratching the windshield. At this point in the story, my mom would take one hand off the steering wheel and scratch the windshield to simulate it. Then whatever was on the roof jumps off. Everyone is still scared, yelling at my auntie to start the van, and she keeps trying. That's when she sees the skinwalker walk up to the driver's side window and stare at her just a few inches away. Well, that's when my auntie jumped in the back and started praying for her life. Minutes pass and the skinwalker appears to leave. Then my auntie hops back in the driver's seat and gets the van to start and off they go. I'm not sure if skinwalkers are real, but I have heard stories. A couple of minutes ago, I was closing up my chicken coop so that no critters can get in after dark. And for some reason every single night, when I go and lock up on the other side of our electrical fence, I hear something pacing back and forth. Sometimes the pacing gets closer, or it sounds like it's going from left to right but never comes close enough. I use my phone's flashlight so it's not too bright, but maybe it sees the phone light and walks where I'm at. Sometimes if I'm out there for a couple of minutes, I hear moaning and weird sounds, sounds that I don't even recognize from any other animal. I live in a small part of my town in Ohio, so there's not that many people. I also don't know that much about skinwalkers, but I'm all alone right now and it's a little scary. I'm 14 years old and I'm house sitting my grandparents while they're on vacation. So back to this theme by the chicken coop. Whenever it walks by, it sounds like it has two legs. So sometimes I think it's a person, but I can never build up the courage to call it out. Also, when it walks by, it makes a lot of noise. I can hear it from 20 to 30 feet away. I don't know why, but the walking around and weird noises freak me out. And just to give you a different picture, the noises weren't human-like or even animal-like. I'm sitting on my bed right now typing this, and I'm kind of freaking out. So if anyone is out there, tell me that I'm just a teenage boy who's imagining things and there's no need to worry tell me the tricks to stay out of the way of skinwalkers because I'm starting to get scared thank you for reading this and yes this is very real one summer when I was only 14 years old I spent a couple of weeks at my grandparents' house on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. It was close to the New Mexico state line, even though it was out in the middle of the hills. It was an awesome place. My little brother, he was 11. My grandmother was a great cook. She makes the best fried bread, and my grandfather tells great stories. 
the kind that you came here anywhere else. Now, thanks to that visit there, I have a story of my own. My grandparents have this old guy, a Navajo too, who does odd jobs around the house. His name is Paul. He carries around the silver flask. One evening, as soon as the sun is going down, my grandmother then tells me to take him home. My grandfather is the one who always does it, but he is out at a neighbor's ranch, helping with some cattle. I say sure, and it gives me the chance to drive my grandfather's old pickup truck, something that I have never been allowed to do back home. But they're on the reservation. No one cares. There's a few people around. It's not like you're going to hurt anyone. So my little brother jumps in with me while Paul and my grandparents' dog climb into the bed. Paul lives in a small hogan, about 10 minutes deeper into the res. By the time we drop him off, the sun is already going down. Back on the road, there's no street lights of any kind. We are driving along, when out of the corner of my eye, I notice some movement there in the scrub and low bushes off to the side. I slow down. There are all kinds of sheep around there. The people who own them, letting them roam about the place freely. I don't want to explain to my grandma why there is blood from a sheep in the front grill. As we drive past the spot where I saw the movement, there's nothing there. So I resume speed, bumping along the dirt road without a care in the world. Then out of nowhere, we get a strong whiff of something nasty, as if some animal has died, and its body is rotting where it fell. With it comes this sense of deep dread, for which I have no explanation. My little brother feels it too, and he doesn't say as much, but I can see it in his face. I then tell him that everything is good, and we keep on driving. Moments later, I look in the rear view mirror, and see this dark silhouette of something very tall and very skinny covered with some kind of hair or fur running behind the truck after us. Whatever it is, it doesn't look human. My brother sees it too and he starts crying. My grandparents' dog is in the back barking. I'm wanting to make the truck go faster but the dirt road is so uneven and the pickup is bouncing and shaking all over the place as it is. I'm afraid if I go any faster, I'll crash it off to the road. My brother then starts to scream because it's coming up alongside the truck on my side. I remember being so scared that all I'm thinking is that this thing is going to get us. Then just as I'm ready to cry too, around the bend and coming at us is this car. Just like that, the feeling of dread and panic disappears. Whatever was chasing us is now gone. When we get back to my grandparents' place, we run into the house, checking at our backs to make sure we weren't followed. My grandmother, obviously seeing that we are upset, tells us what's the matter. We can't get the story out fast enough. She tells us it was Yinadoshi, something the Navajo call a skinwalker. She explains that they are people who use black magic and bad medicine. I've been back there many times since then, but this is my only encounter with a skinwalker. So this happened about 12 years ago. My family owns a farm in the heart of an Indian reservation. One winter I was home for Christmas Taking care of the farm, as I was home by myself, late in the night, I hear all of our cows freaking out. I knew it had to be the wild dogs. There are plenty of those in the area. So I throw on some boots, grab a shotgun, load it up, and head out to the field. This was a perfect scenario for a horror movie. It was cloudy, but there was a full moon, and it was breaking through the clouds just right to light up all the snow. I ran out into the middle of the field and just in time I see two dogs but they were standing up facing each other and fighting I think perfect two for one so I pump a shell into the chamber of Mr. 12 gauge and then it happened 
the two dogs heard the rack, they both stopped, looked over at me, and ran away on their back legs. I froze, and every ghost story about skinwalkers and all the other native legends I grew up with came to my mind. Also, keep in mind that I am a white guy, and up until then, these were all just boogeyman stories that the native kids like to tell to scare us. But that night, they became real to me. My uncle is Mexican and Native American. This happened in the Mojave Desert in South California. He was driving around with his girlfriend late at night and they saw something that looked like a huge black dog on the side of the road. He slowed down and the dog then began crossing the road. Instead of walking like a normal dog would, this thing moved like a toy rocking horse. He said it stopped in the middle of the road and stared at them, and its eyes had a red glow. My uncle is the most badass person I know, and it scared the shit out of him. A man from the reservation has just delivered a bull to a buyer's ranch out to the far reaches of the reservation, getting lost in a couple of hours. It is a large expanse of land, and what maps are available aren't always available. Anyways, it's late and getting dark by the time he gets home on the main road towards home. Just as he gets to the intersection where there's no stop sign, he sees up ahead right in the middle of the road, alone, Coyote. It's just standing there. So before he starts driving, he leans on the horn. In response, he watches as the Coyote raises up on its back legs. It assumes the form of a man, only his legs and feet. Arms and hands seem more canine than human. And with a spastic gait, it starts walking towards the opposite shoulder. The man, not believing what he's seen, closes his eyes and shakes his head. When again he looks, there's the coyote sitting off to the side of the road and looking back at him as if it's waiting on him to drive by. The man, certain that it's the lights playing tricks on him and the fact that it has been a long and draining drive. However, as he passes the coyote, he gives it a quick look and he sees that this coyote is grinning back at him. Having heard stories of skinwalkers, the man blesses himself and he fixes his eyes on the road ahead. Me and four of my buddies on a reserve, day one about 8.30 in the morning about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a fat black bear. We only had what you call muzzle loaders. They are like a Civil War style gun. You get one shot, then you gotta reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer, so at 2 p.m. after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We end up finding a hellacious animal trail, and he drops me off. I tell him pick me up I'll be on the road after dark. He's about 7 miles away. I sit there from 2 p.m. till dark and all I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway so it does get dark and I creep down to the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see something, crashes into the thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I'm thinking that maybe it's a deer, so I call just to get a reaction, but nothing. So I creep on it, thinking I can bust it if it's a deer, but it doesn't move. He's just sniffing like a dog. Sniff, sniff, sniff. I kick the ground and stop trying to bump it, but the dog just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear, and I'm 10 feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm gonna have to hip shoot it if it's a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot 
A big elk off to my right in the full moonlight. I see something drive out of the bushes into the thickest part in the road to my left. It's a standoff. Eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart, four foot off the ground. It's just sniffing over and over. It's full, dark, and this thing is stalking me using cover. My buddy lights start shining down the road, and this thing crashes through the bushes away. I figure it's a bear, but I don't know. I was a little bit scared, I'm not gonna lie. I had one shot in the dark, coyotes howling like crazy too. And the predators were out in full effect, on the full moonlight. I live right next to a Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and it only takes about 25 to 30 minutes. I have made this trip dozens of times and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest, however, about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. This day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I ready myself to begin the journey through. I was 10 steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure of what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation, so I whispered, hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my voice. Hello? My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I was going to faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply. Hello? 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 As my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale, and I realized for the first time that there was no typical forest sound. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets, nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I had enough and was wielding my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard some rustling in the bushes. 20 feet to my left. I watched as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush as it came further out and stood up on twos. I took off. I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, laid down, and thought about what happened. My mom came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, 
I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess. I was afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. But this terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds got quiet. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy. Amy. Come here. Hello? Stop it. My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature that they called Yi Naudroshi, or he who goes on all fours, or a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required, and that this witch had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me, and that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching on my window, then a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, it started calling my name, but drawing it out really far, like Amy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it into my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is this thing seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that.